Thank you, Martin, for taking us through the doors of mechanical and uh, conservation perception of uh, what Dr. Schultes and Dr. Hoffman and Weston LeVar, who worked on peyote, would say is uh, a plan of the gods. And I would argue that uh, peyote is one of its ancestors is uh, cannabis uh, in terms of plant of the gods. But that's only one use of our multi-purpose plant. This is not the presentation I'm giving. I forgot it at home, so I'm giving it up. Uh, in the past, including this one, in the past about six weeks, there will be three presentations that I've given. Uh, the first one was at the Society of Ethnobiology in Denver some weeks ago. And that was on persistent ritualistic hemp fiber use in Eurasia. And that this reflects ancient shamanistic relationships is the hypothesis. And hemp is linked with shamanism, I believe, we believe, as I'll mention with my co-author, because some cannabis can be psychoactive and has served as a valuable ally in vision and spirit quests for thousands of years, I would argue. This linkage remains manifested in the ritual use of hemp rope and cloth bridges as pathways or passageways for the spirits across much of Eurasia. And our hypothesis in that presentation and part of a much larger study is that the ritualistic use of hemp, cannabis, fiber today in a variety of regions of Eurasia has or did persist for many centuries, even millennia, after psychoactive use was suppressed and or was forgotten. Then at the Society of American Archaeology, a much larger gathering of 2,700 presentations in an, uh, a session on the ancient use or uh, psychoactive use in ancient societies. I presented this cannabis uh, tale of two Central Asian burial sites that are remarkable. One in, that was uh, discovered in the early 20th century, and one in this early in this century. And I want to take you to those two sites just briefly to put in perspective what I'll talk today about in the ancient use of fiber and seed in fishing. So the first site uh, that I want to mention, Kurgan or burial site, is in the Passerich Mountain Valley. And if you were here for Robert Spengel's talk earlier, uh, he described this area and his research on archaeological uh, research that relates to uh, pastoralism and agricultural uh, cultivation history. The Passerich Mountain Valley is one site. We'll come back to that. The other is in the arid Turpin site. Uh, actually, it's a tomb. Both of these uh, are, one is in the, just in the inside of Western China and here in Turpan, and the other is just inside of Eastern uh, Russia in Pasir. So the, uh, most people that have read any literature on cannabis and its history know that Herodotus, 2,500 years ago roughly, uh, spoke about the so-called barbarians to the north, the Scythians, who uh, in their funeral rites would uh, have a small tent-like structure supported by these poles and a sensor inside and with a charcoal or burning coals would introduce a cannabis and then the vapors uh, or the smoke that would uh, be created, they would then inhale and howl in their vapor baths as, he, uh, as it can be translated. Well, interestingly, 2,500 years later, this was verified in the tombs with the pictures you saw there with actual cannabis seeds in them. Let's move 100 years later to just uh, the research that occurred in the earlier part of this century uh, and came out in a couple of articles uh, dealing with this tomb, one of many tombs in the Yanghai site near Tarpan. And here we have what is considered to be a, a shaman uh, in the Gushi culture tomb about 2,700 years old. And this is really a remarkable uh, macro-botanical or archaeobotanical discovery. And the manner in which these, uh, uh, the representation and uh, deposition of the body and artifacts suggest that a psychoactive ceremonial or medicinal, medicinal context for cannabis. What we see here is the, um, the burial, and there's the, uh, the shaman's head. Uh, here is about two pounds of cannabis, leaves, stems, flowers, and seeds. And these were enclosed in this woven uh, container. 
And then another container down here that probably was like a mortar and pestle used to prepare medicinal plants uh, or herbs. And so this connection together is, is quite remarkable. Nothing's ever been found uh, for many plants in this condition, preserved about 30 feet below the surface, extremely hot in summer and quite cold in the winter, but an equal temperature more or less in this location. So it was preserved for all these years. It tells us something about the uh, connection of this plant. None of the fibrous materials in this particular site are made of cannabis. And uh, so this is probably an indication that it was a, for psychoactive use. It was tested later, uh, the materials that were recovered belonging to the cannabis, and uh, the potential of psychoactivity based on the remains, and therefore may have been used, as I said, for medicinal and or religious ritual. Today I'm going to talk about ancient use of hemp seed and fiber, potentially in fishing in the ancient period throughout much of Eurasia, especially uh, in, uh, uh, well, along streams, rivers, wetlands, and I'm going to present some theoretical and some archaeological considerations. Notice the picture, oops, excuse me, go back. Uh, first of all, this was uh, above my uh, desk at the University of Hawaii for about 20 years after I purchased it in uh, Singapore, and only recently did I discover that this was uh, would have value and relevance to this particular presentation. Uh, again, excuse me. Uh, these are showing you the domestication of cannabis is reflected here in the artificial selection for different seed sizes. Uh, the seeds of cannabis have long been a, a used as a food. It was one of the five top greens in China until some thousands of years ago when it was replaced by sesame or other uh, crops that came in. It's still a snack food and sold in a, a number of places in China as such, as you can see uh, right here at, in this, uh, southern China. Uh, this over here is a picture of a net, <clears throat> probably, but not uh, analyzed uh, and confirmed yet, in an ancient site near the Turpan burial uh, that I just represented. So uh, all of three of these presentations are part of uh, a much larger project that lasted about 15 years ago at the Society of Ethno, uh, Economic Botany in London. I ran into a person who had been inspired by my master's thesis and a little book, and he wrote a book which has been impressed for 30 years. He's a lifetime member of our society. That's Robert Clark. And it was also the first time I met uh, Wilma Clashy, his wife and his children. So it was a momentous day in my life in 1996 at Imperial College in London. Uh, so impressed today is the University, of at the University of California. Finally, I know a number of people have said we never believed we would ever be there. I'm still alive. I mean, uh, it'll probably be roughly 500 to 1,000 pages. And uh, uh, this is just part of it. But one of many hypotheses that we've developed, and along with a full discussion of its evolutionary biology, its theoretical origins, which we'll discuss briefly here, and also as it applies to Eurasia and its availability in the ancient Paleolithic, into the Mesolithic, and into the Neolithic, and in the Pleistocene, into the Holocene. So I want to talk about cannabis as an extraordinary, briefly extraordinary, multi-purpose genus, and even though fishing has been connected in the past, some new potential uses, some of which you may uh, know about if you fish in rivers and lakes, uh, from England to the U.S. or to parts of Eurasia elsewhere, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, river island and wetland resource use of cannabis, the role of fishing in Eurasian human resource use, modern use of hemp seed as fish bait, huh, really? And then finally, <laughs> some theoretical considerations based on some biogeography, archaeobotany, archaeology, and ethno-botanical history. So most of us know that this is a multi-purpose plant. It ranks right up there with coconut and bamboo, and some would like to think tens of thousands of uses. Most of these are modern industrial uses. But even way back, this pro uh, provided people, potentially, when they figured out how they could use it for food and fiber and medicine and spiritual purposes and other for other purposes. And just a few pictures to represent some of the use from medicinal use starting and even from a scientific point of view back in the early part of the 19th century of Shaughnessy uh, pictured there and over here the sadhu uh, on the search for enlightenment in India where it has been used for a couple thousand to maybe three thousand years probably somewhere in that uh, range but only but not for fiber very much in India it comes in much later 
uh, than its northern uh, Eurasian uh, use and uh, presence. Now, among the uses, fishing purposes. Now, among those are its use as a durable, waterproof uh, means of plugging up holes in uh, boats, uh, or as a caulking, and also in constructions of boats, and these have been used for long periods of time. The picture here on the left is in China again, and with the use of some pitch, or resin, or asphalt, or some kind of glue, this is a very effective way of patching up holes in your boat or canoe of various levels, and had throughout history, hemp rope is extremely important in the history of sailing vessels, well, military vessels, but also transport vessels, and, of course, I, from my point of view here, fishing vessels. Also, hemp fiber past and present for nets, lines, even with decoys and harpoons for uh, fish lines, and nets, the importance of nets in the history of humans, as some other anthropologists and archaeologists have been arguing uh, more recent, recent decades, is very important. Unlike arrowheads and other uh, more durable materials, they tend to break down and disappear. Recently, a 30,000-year-old uh, threads and cordage were found in the Northern Caucasus, and uh, that's Others have been found elsewhere. Their definitive confirmation of what fiber, whether it's linen or hemp from cannabis or others, hasn't been determined. I think in the range of cannabis, naturally, it had uh, a use. And once the, perhaps with some management and uh, for longer, taller plants, fibers, they could have made some very effective nets. For collecting small game, large game, maybe in the role in domestication or collection and then eventually management and investigation of horses, and here I want to talk about its use for fishing. So we're going to move relatively quickly. Don't get frenzied, but the fish do. <laughs> and this is just, when you go and Google hemp, seed, and fishing, throw in carp, and you will see how uh, important this is as a uh, fish bait today. So I'm projecting way in the past, and I want to indicate that in the Ecological Association of Humans and Hemp, this helps explain, and there may be some evolutionary, uh, beyond, beyond cultural evolution, but even uh, biological evolution, in terms of what's contained in fish, what do we eat fish for, some of us, uh, think about some of the therapeutic aspects reputed in fish, and some of those same compounds in seeds and cannabis. And so you can also see the, uh, this picture, remember the little the uh, statue I had up a uh, ceramic piece above my desk, uh, and it reminded me of uh, these large fish caught, and I just wondered whether this harks back to the use of him as a chum, a bait, then with nets, or later with lines. Because of the acting nature of the seed, you can put uh, one of these seeds on a line or through a hook, even before, perhaps, a metal with certain pieces of wood, and or uh, when they fall over, just as when you wet the, the seed, it starts to germinate, and that releases the uh, plant, uh, the odor and the oils, and this is very attractive to fish. So cannabis can be found growing wild in the upland regions, on slopes, undulating foothills throughout much of uh, Central Asia, and as again, uh, Robert Spangler will tell you, it's quite common in Central Asia. But it's natural where it does flourishes and its best ecological adaptation is along streams, spontaneously growing in disturbed areas where nutrient-rich, uh, open to the environment, and it will, uh, the sun-loving plant will grow quite well. Humans and other animals come to drink water and also to hunt each other or hunt uh, there, and this would be an ideal place to contact cannabis. And if it grows and falls over, the seeds are in the water over hundreds, thousands, millennia, perhaps millions of years, and these, this activity of the seeds in the water, and they start to germinate, and the fish are attracted, and this over time was probably a long-term relationship here ecologically uh, from its natural in the uh, well drain, but on the edges of streams, and humans interaction with it. So, theoretical uh, considerations. Most human existence, roving in small bands, wild food, many different environments, end of the Pleistocene, Holocene, uh, 
much change, not only in the environment, but in uh, human uh, cultural evolution. And as Carl Sauer said, uh, it is in these mild lands where after the meltwaters, river valleys invited human ingenuity. It was a favorable uh, event or series of events, uh, conditions to test the possibilities of waterside life. And some groups began to take up permanent residency. And fish as a stable protein source meant that you didn't have to be semi-nomadic or moving in, in search of uh, food and game. <coughs> so I've all run out of time, but just to, if I can complete the, the, con the uh, suggestion here theoretically and mention just briefly there's quite a bit of archaeological <coughs> background to support this, that fishing along streams became extremely important and it is a multi-purpose water-resistant fibers, potentially euphoric and medicinal drugs, as well as fish poisons. And cannabis is this kind of a multi-purpose and accessible plant, especially for those in these well-situated progressive fishing folk living thousands of years ago along the rivers going into the Great Caspian uh, Sea, or into the Black uh, Sea, or into the Aral Sea and along the Don and the Volga, and up into the mountains. Many, many rivers in the coming into the steppes, but up into the mountains. And this, I believe, 35,000 years ago, as anatomically modern humans moved out of Africa, eventually first probably into Eurasia, into Central Asia, eventually west and east. They encountered cannabis, and whether or not it was for euphoric reasons, or whether or not it was for fiber, or for food, Eventually, they had a multi-purpose plant and probably spread it far and wide. And archaeologically, we have ice, uh, stable isotopes indicating lots of fish consumed from the Paleolithic into the Neolithic. We also have phytoliths of cannabis and pollen of cannabis and or humulus associated in similar sites. Going back some into the, uh, right on the border of the Holocene and those thousands of years coming in to the Holocene. An amazing site that only recently not many people know about. I told uh, Dr. Crocker, who's uh, authority on archaeology work in Japan, Korea, now in China, that in an excavation for construction, 10,000-year-old potsherds and stuck to them, and this is south of Tokyo in the Bozo, Bozo Peninsula, where cannabis seeds. The Jomon people, probably the people moving in there, had brought it in. So in the Paleolithic, cannabis was spread across Eurasia, and probably as a food source, it again is a dump uh, heat plant, a plant as a camp following weed, and then providing lots of uses. And isn't it interesting, all the way to Japan, the history of Korea, and of course in China, thousands and thousands of years, that it was among the few plants that were found in say the Jomon hunters and gatherers that were probably managed about five plants, and cannabis is one of them. And there's archaeological evidence, 3,000, 5,000, now 10,000 years old, with the oldest pottery, too. And the Jomon name of that broad cultural unit goes back 13, 10 to 13,000 years ago. Jomon means corded pottery. What were the cords of? Thank you very much.